Cora, thank you for being here. And I want to start right on that 2020 outlook for the year. Um, tell us just how you're kind of seeing the business um, evolve over the course of the year. I think you did say that Q2 looks like it might be pretty tough, but you're sensing a rebound uh, basically for the rest of the year. Yeah, so in the first quarter, we had, of course, a big challenge with COVID. And we were very happy that through hard work of all our employees, we were able to maintain continuity of the business. We were able to maintain supplies to the 200 million patients we have uh, depending on our medicines every day. And uh, that was a great achievement. And that resulted also in some very good results in the first quarter. For the remainder of the year, we see maybe some reversal of some of the extra demand we saw in March. But basically underlying, we see a strong business development and we are confident that we will see revenues in line with our guidance. I want to ask you also about that increased demand you saw in the first quarter. Uh, Teva, of course, a huge supplier of generic medicines. Um, and the FDA is reporting uh, increased numbers of drug shortages, especially in drugs related to treatment of COVID-19. Um, and for Teva provided drugs, it lists Famotidine tablets, and we know that's one of the drugs being tested potentially for COVID-19, azithromycin, which is an antibiotic, uh, other drugs for anesthesia, um, that look like just increased demand led to the uh, these being on allocation or back orders. Uh, but for one of them, Propofol, um, you say that your supply chain was impacted by shipping delays due to COVID-19. Tell us just what you're seeing uh, around drugs like that. Yeah, so first of all, it's absolutely correct that some of the ICU medications have been in higher demand, and some of the products like acetomycin have also been in higher demand. In all these cases, we have been dramatically increasing our outputs and our manufacturing in order to secure supplies for all the patients who need these products. There has also been some delays, but not dramatic, in the distribution. This has been due to the fact that the reduction in air traffic led to less uh, air cargo being available, and some of the short-term restrictions on exports that some countries implemented also led to temporary delays. But I would like to say that all governments, at the end of the day, have been very positive towards securing the full, uh, you could say, value chain being open for uh, medical uh, products worldwide. Is that something you're still encountering, uh, the difficulty with the air travel and just transporting products where they need to go? It is still a challenge, but I think we've overcome it. Uh, prices of transportation has gone up. Uh, we have also increased our volumes uh, on these specific products that are needed. And I think overall it's working out uh, quite well. And um, of course, we have a situation here where we are, like you said, we're the world's biggest manufacturer of pharmaceutical products or medicines, the biggest supplier in the U.S. of medicines. But I think overall, we are very happy that all our facilities are operating at full capacity and we have overcome the majority of the logistical challenges we've been seeing. Hi, it's Sarah Eisen. Wanted to ask you about hydroxychloroquine, which I know you're one of the big manufacturers of. Um, it's been somewhat controversial here. There was so much demand and it was being used so widely and empirically in places like New York at the outset. And, and then the FDA put out a warning. And I'm wondering what you're seeing in terms of demand and what happens to all of those, those pills that you or, or those doses of that medication that you previously donated to governments like the U.S. to help fight this. Yeah, basically, uh, I, I wouldn't be able to tell you sort of short term what's happening to the product we donated. And uh, I wouldn't be able to give you either a clarifying answer as to the clinical effect of the product or not. But it's quite clear that we were simply responding to a demand that we saw. We did our very best to secure this short term from our different manufacturing sites where we produce the product. And I think we were quite successful in supplying the product. And, and then, of course, the clinical outcomes and how it can be used or not be used that is something that is being determined by the healthcare professionals. Wanted to also ask you about the second wave, which we're all expecting. Do Dr. Fauci here in this country at the NIH thinks that it's inevitably coming. And what we're hearing is that hospitals and healthcare professionals need to be preparing, governments need to be preparing for the fall by stocking up on medications like antibiotics or paralytics or, or other treatments that you use. Are you seeing that actually happening? Are they are they taking necessary precautions to stock up? I think it's too early to say because I think the demand we're seeing right now is more related to the current uh, level of 
the, the COVID-19 patients in many, many hospitals in the U.S. And we've been working very hard also through our distributor ANDA to secure that whenever we had regional shortages, we would go in and support the states, the hospitals, to make sure they would get products as soon as possible. Overall, I think right now we see an okay supply situation. There are some shortages, but I think we're overcoming most of that. And of course, it's important that we all increase manufacturing of these products so that we are prepared for a potential second wave. Let's hope it doesn't happen. Let's hope some of the precautions we take in society will be effective so that we do not see a major second wave. Mr. Schultz, it's David Faber. There's been a lot of talk of late of, of the, in the U.S. about securing our supply chain for pharmaceuticals and for various drugs, uh, from raw materials right up to uh, produ production. Um, given you're the largest producer in the world, and I know you source raw materials from China, you have manufacturing there, you have manufacturing in India and Europe, uh, would it be a significant hindrance to your business if, in fact, there were some uh, move to try to make sure that manufacturing moved back to the U.S.? I think it's a historical fact that manufacturing of raw materials and API has moved out of the U.S. over the last 10, 20 years uh, due to competitive forces between the key manufacturers today, China and India. Um, we have a lot of manufacturing still in Europe for historical reasons that we have maintained, also in Israel. But it's true that the most competitive place today is China, India. They have benefits on labor cost, on environmental concerns, on health and safety, and so on. Um, if it was to be moved back to the U.S., it would have to be some preferential treatment of products that were manufactured partly or wholly in the U.S., and that would be possible to do gradually. It would not be possible to do overnight. It would be a gradual process. And given the current circumstances, it would lead to higher cost of API and raw materials and ultimately of the finished products. Cora, are you being pressured or encouraged strongly by the U.S. government to uh, try to bring your manufacturing end-to-end uh, -end back into the United States or into the United States um, for, for your medicines that you supply here? No, that's not the case. But it is, of course, an open, I would say it's an open political question. It's really a political decision. It's not a decision that we as a company, we as Teva, or that the industry as such will take because we are simply reacting to the conditions in the marketplace. And if there is, you know, a preferential treatment of products produced in the U.S., then, of course, we will adjust to that, and that will bring more manufacturing back to the U.S. But as I, I said before, the conditions for manufacturing API and raw materials in, in the U.S. are such that the cost levels of that are higher. And, uh, of course, we'll be more than willing to do it, but it would only be possible if there's a preferential treatment for those products. And I want to follow up also on a question that Sarah asked about that preparation for the second wave. And, you know, you noted that most people are still dealing with the first wave, but that it is um, imperative that, you know, you increase manufacturing now of these products to be ready. So are you, are you observing kind of still a, a last minute kind of dealing with what we have now and, and a failure to plan ahead um, that it sounds like you are trying to plan ahead with increasing manufacturing. But one of the things that's been so remarkable about this whole situation is it seems like everybody's playing catch up and trying to just last minute make sure we've got what we need. Uh, what are you sensing from the government in terms of its attempts to plan ahead? It sounds like maybe you're taking that initiative, not because governments are. I think it's fair to say that everybody was surprised by COVID-19. That's fair to say, everybody in the whole world, uh, including uh, Teva and including all healthcare systems and politicians. So now, of course, uh, we're not surprised anymore. We know it's there. We know from historical evidence of previous pandemics that there is a risk of a second wave. And that, of course, means that we have a responsibility to patients to prepare for that. So, so that's what we are doing. We can only prepare on the products that we manufacture. We cannot go out and prepare for everything because we don't manufacture everything. But we do manufacture more uh, pharmaceutical products than anybody else. And we are, of course, looking at all those products that are relevant in the treatment of COVID-19 and making sure that we increase manufacturing of those as we speak. Right. And finally, I want, I want to ask you about the impacts on other medicines um, as a result of what's happening with COVID-19. We know from a lot of companies that some clinical trial uh, development programs are getting delayed. 
At the end of all of this, what kind of delay do you expect we're going to be seeing in new medicines getting to market uh, outside of COVID-19 because of the pandemic? Yeah, I think that there's going to be some delay uh, long term. Uh, of course, you have to keep in mind that developing a new drug takes 10 to 15 years, and that means a three-month delay on, on your clinical trial recruitment is not really a catastrophe. We have a very interesting phase three program ongoing together with Regeneron on Facinumab, a new pain medication. That's in phase three. All the patients are recruited. We expect that to continue. But we also have new clinical trials that we were just about to start, and that has been stopped for now. So I think the, the length of the lockdown is really what drives whether we will see big delays or not. If we get a lockdown with the effective duration of, let's say, three to six months, then it will be a marginal long-term effect on, uh, on new drug development.